Hello everyone, and welcome to CS441-541 Artificial Intelligence. As always, I'm Bart Massey, and as always, I hope you're all doing well and staying safe out there during this difficult time. Today I want to start into a topic that's near and dear to my heart, state space search, often also called combinatorial search. You'll use, hear me use both terms. And it's often taught as a first or foundational method of AI because it's pretty simple to understand. It builds on what you already know from computer science, and yet it's an extremely powerful technique for getting intelligent behavior out of software with minimal programmer effort. The, so it's an exciting place to begin. The reason I care so much about it is that I spent many years in graduate school working in this area and doing this kind of stuff and so for me that's a lot of the big fun of what ai is about so let's just dive in here and talk first about sort of this idea of why 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 are we doing this what are we doing so let's start with this premise one of the ways that you might determine that something is acting intelligently is that it thinks ahead. It thinks about what's going to happen next. It looks forward toward the future. So there's a very famous example in which if you let a dog loose next to a chain link fence and you're on the other side of the fence, dogs are very bad at figuring out that they need to run around to the gate in the chain link fence. Instead, they'll try to go directly toward you. Their plant dog's planning abilities, not that great in general. People are better at that. If I put you on the other side of a chain link fence and ask you to come toward me, you're going to uh, look for a gate. You're, if you can't find a gate anywhere, you might go clear around outside. It, only as a last resort will you climb the fence, even though it's sort of the notion, notionally shortest route. And in general, that's sort of how problem solving works and problem solving is what AI is about. A problem is usually not solved all in a single chunk. It's solved a piece at a time. You think about one thing you're going to do and you think about the next thing you're going to do and you think about the consequences of each thing you're going to do. So you build up this elaborate plan in your head where if I do this, this will happen and then I can do this and you might look through a lot of alternatives about how you might achieve your goal. And that's sort of where state space search comes from, the, the trick here is that looking ahead gets complicated fast. If you're trying to decide, for example, how to turn the face of that Rubik's cube, cube all blue, you're going to have to select a whole bunch of turns of faces, and you have to think about a lot of choices about how you could try to do that, and it blows up pretty quickly. And there's sort of two general kinds of approach to that kind of problem, maybe three. Maybe if you're a normal human, you just poke at it very slowly because humans don't try alternatives very quickly and try to figure it out. You might manipulate things without doing a ton of planning ahead and just use heuristics, and that's something we talked about last week. If you're a mathematician or whatever, you might actually try to formally deduce, you might actually write a set of rules and observations that always hold for Rubik's Cubes and try to find a plan for solving a Rubik's Cube that way. If you're a computer, you might just try all the plans. You might try, you know, just keep trying plans. I can probably try a million a minute, literally, plans for how to get that face blue, and eventually that Rubik's Cube face might turn blue. And that is the domain of computer state space search. We've, we've thought about this problem of getting a computer to examine likely good candidates quickly, and we found some fairly fancy techniques for doing that. And again, like so much of AI, there's going to be the question, is this AI or algorithms or mathematics or some combination of the above? And again, one of the definitions of AI we talked about a while back is that sort of AI is whatever computers can't do yet. AI is one of those areas where the stuff that often gets worked out as part of the artificial intelligence enterprise becomes mainstream in other enterprises once we've started down that road. And that's what part of the fun of AI, but it's also part of the frustration of AI. 
the thing is this brute force search is doomed to failure any algorithmicist will tell you that probably p is not equal to np probably there are problems that you just can't find an efficient path quickly an efficient solution quickly and so we're going to have to make some guesses. We're going to have to abstract or approximate. We're going to have to use heuristics. And sometimes we're going to fail to find a solution even when we know one exists because things get complicated super fast. But maybe we can use the error-free computation and the crazily fast computation of the modern digital computer to actually get this to work better even than a human could, right? The computer can construct sort of examine the consequences of his actions very, very quickly, right? Like I say, millions of things a second and perfectly. It basically, if it makes a mistake, it's because you programmed it wrong. And if you program it right, you know, there's none of this, oh, I added seven and five and got 13 stuff. It just isn't a thing that happens with computers. Humans, right, are bad in both these areas. I can look at, a few dozen things a minute and I on a good day and I'm gonna screw up some of my analysis almost every time because analysis is hard so we might want to just try to lean on the computer to do the thing it does well which is to go fast and make correct computations for their decisions so when we think about things like finding a route in a map finding a good schedule for executing a plan, actually producing a good plan, solving puzzles like the Rubik's Cube, playing games like chess, figuring out what actions a robot should take, and on and on. One of the tools we use is this idea of state space search. We're gonna look ahead at what might happen based on what we do and try to find a good path through the state space. And this isn't just a standalone technique. If you're doing pattern matching, machine learning, all the things that sort of are fancy AI, it turns out that adding a search piece in, bolting it in just right, is a pretty powerful technique. If you look at what uh, AlphaGo does or any of the Google Alpha players, the chess player or whatever, those are machine learners fundamentally, but the machine learning technique that they use involves an awful lot of state space search, an awful lot of trying things to learn what's gonna happen. And so those two techniques aren't enemies, they blend together really nicely. So I keep talking about state spaces. What's a state? A state is a situation. It's, a, it's some situation that a system can be in. So for example, in the Rubik's Cube, you might see what colors all of the cubies are on that cube that sort of is a state of the cube right what's a state space well it's a graph that connects states to other states graph in the computer science sense so if you imagine spinning that rubik's cube now you have a different state and you can sort of label you know that the the transition edge right that connects the two you can say well if i turn the front face clockwise then i get a new state and if I, in that new state, turn the front face counterclockwise a quarter turn, I get the original state back. And you start to build up a graph. And we call that set of states that are reachable in one step for, from a, in a state space. Uh, th those neighbors are the graph edges. Um, and th we call those the neighbors. And you know those things reachable from in one step are the neighbors, just like you do in normal graph stuff. And typically, in a state space, those states are connected by doing something. I, you know, mark, like I say, turn a side of the Rubik's Cube, and I can imagine this graph, right, of all the possible ways that Rubik's Cube could be, and, you know, that's gonna be lots and lots of states. For a Rubik's Cube, it's sort of a ridiculous number of states. Nobody really knows, but, more than you could ever fit in a computer. Even if I had time to look at all the states in that state space graph, I wouldn't have the memory to store it, and not by a little, by many, many, many orders of magnitude. And so 
with this Rubik's Cube, I'm gonna be limited in how much of the state space I can search. And that's funny, right? Because the Rubik's Cube is not a very complicated object, right? There's only It's only got these, you know, whatever it is, six times nine is 54 cubies, right? Well, 54 cube faces. And, uh, you know, it's got the these uh, 27 cubies, one of which doesn't count, so 26, that, you know, that's it. That's all you're, all you're working with in a three by three cube. Um, and so that's why we call this combinatorial search. It's because sort of many, many, a very, very big graph, a combinatorial number of graph states and graph edges exist even for a very small state description. The state description of individual states of the Rubik's Cube are small. The number of them that you can generate is large. The size of that graph is ridiculous. And so we find ourselves not so much being able to use the sort of CS350 techniques as brute force techniques because you know, depth first search or breadth first search. Well, yeah, the, the the worst case search time is proportional to the number of edges or the number of nodes. Well, you know, we aren't going to be able to do that, and we probably can't do breadth first search anyway because the space requirement is proportional to the you know number of nodes as well, and uh, that in general, and that's uh, more than we're going to fit in memory. Let's think about roadmaps, because that's often a place where you start when you're thinking about this stuff. Let's get out a map of uh, Portland real fast and look at that. Well, it says Marion County, but really I'm focusing on the greater Portland area. So here we got a map of some of the interstates in Portland. Let's ignore the smaller roads for a moment. And why do I call this a graph? I mean, it looks like a map, right? But we sort of know that you know, we could sort of, the shape of the roads mostly doesn't matter for getting around Portland. I'm really not that interested in every little curve in that. And so we do a classic AI thing. We do an abstraction. We say, well, you know, if I take each intersection on the map and replace that with a node in the map, and then I connect all the nodes, all the intersections with, you know, edges, representing roads and maybe I put weights on the edges make you know that correspond to travel time or travel distance now I've taken this very concrete geometric thing of a 2d map and turned it into an abstract graph and to some large extent that's a step in the right direction because I can reason about that object a lot easier. The representation of that state is smaller. So what do I mean by a state here? Well, a state would just be the map graph and I would be at some particular node in that um, map graph. So maybe I start out down here at the intersection of 205 and 5 near my house and I want to get to Troutdale. And so now, in, you know, the sort of state of the problem is just sort of where am I? And you know, a path um, uh, uh, to Troutdale corresponds to some traversal of graph edges through these various intersections until I get to where I'm going. So that kind of abstraction, that kind of modeling is a really useful tool. And of course, as you know, from algorithms or from even data structures uh, or from uh, the discrete math, your know, discrete math classes, whatever, there are reasonable algorithms for finding the shortest path from here to here in a weighted, edge weighted graph like this uh, that run in time proportional to the number of edges. So great, that's all we need to do, right? Proportional to the number of intersections, you know, sort of the square of the number of intersections, really. And that sounds fantastic, yay us. But now let's throw in all the little intermediate streets because maybe my best path from here to here is not through the interstates. Maybe I should cut through Portland somehow. 
oh, the object's getting bigger, right? And as you start to get bigger and bigger, the number of possible paths starts to grow pretty rapidly. And pretty fast, you're in a bad place. So, at some point, the simple algorithms don't scale, and at some point we have to do something intelligent. One of the heuristics we use as human beings is that, in general, we tend toward using the interstates rather than cutting through neighborhoods because we believe that, in general, it's going to be faster, and that's absolutely a worthwhile heuristic. But it means we may miss the optimal solution sometimes. Uh, and then you think about other intellectual obstacles. What if there's an accident along the way somewhere? What if there's traffic, you know, known to be at this, at on 205 around 5 p.m. and that's when I'm traveling? All of a sudden, you have to start making better decisions. But we don't throw away this state space search framework. We just elaborate on it. So sorry. So you know, there's sort of. The, the the dumb way to do it, right, that doesn't require any search at all, is just to say, well, I'm just going to keep going in the direction that looks like it's, you know, I'll traverse these edges in the order that gets me the closest. So, for example, you know, I, I might choose to go on I-5 North because that goes in the right general direction, or I might choose to go, oops, sorry about that, I might choose to go east on 205 because that also tends to go there and which one of those is actually closer to Troutdale um well it depends on where I put the intersections right that doesn't sound like a good idea and so I may want to think about it at a deeper level than just head in the general direction that you're going until you get there you know I, I could get stuck it's hard to get stuck on the interstates but if I ever get off the interstate it's real possible I'll be headed toward Troutdale but I'll be at a dead-end road and I'll have to turn around that can't be a good thing so all of a sudden I need to think about all this again so dead end side trips, we want to avoid those. So better is probably to look ahead. And, you know, the obvious thing to do is to say, well, you know, what are the closest intersections to where I am? And look at all those and then look at the closest intersections to those that are, you know, going whatever direction and keep going. And you can imagine spreading through the map like this until you um, find a path to your destination. If you do this the right way, that's Dijkstra search. That's a, a depth first search, or sorry, a best first search method. And it's, you know, pretty smart way to go. It has the problem that I'm gonna examine an awful lot of places. I'll end up out here in Hillsboro sooner or later looking at that when Hillsboro's obviously not the right thing. And so it might be that there are things we can do, and sure enough there are, to do better than that. Another problem you might run in is the looping problem. If I just look at all the neighbors of where I am and compute the distance from there, well, it's real easy for me to go around on 205 and back on uh, 26 and then come back down to 205. That can't be a good thing. I know I don't want any loops in these paths. And so I'm going to have to use a data structure called a stop list that remembers where I've been during this search and tries to find good ways there. But the point is, even as simple a problem as this, even as simple a problem as traversing a map to find a good route to a destination, starts to look less like an algorithms problem at some point, although it's still a lot like that, and more like an artificial intelligence problem. And that's an interesting situation to be in. If I were to zoom out even further and ask, how do I get from Portland to uh, Philadelphia, let's say, Portland's too small to be even on the map, well, now I'm gonna have to look at an awful lot of roads. There's gonna be an awful lot of search to do, and so it's gonna rapidly get, if I try to look at every little road in, you know, Illinois and Missouri and wherever, uh, probably not gonna scale very well. I probably can't just use Dijkstra or anything just like Dijkstra. And so I'm probably gonna have to find more intelligent ways to search this state space. And in terms of, and Google Maps, if I ask it how to get from, uh, get where get there, let's go back to Oregon for a second and ask it how to get from Portland to uh, San Diego. Sorry, from Portland to uh, 
Philadelphia is what I meant. Directions to, let's flip it the other way around. I don't know why it always does that. Um, Philadelphia, PA. And it's gonna sit there and you'll notice how fast it found me a route. And this is probably, oops, now I undid it. Let's find it again, because it was fast the first time. It will be fast again, right? Um, And can I hide this without closing it? No, I can't. Okay, oh, there we go. There's the button that slides it out. If you look at this path, it says, oh, 42 hours um, of driving, which sounds about right. So, you know, if we have two drivers and swap through the night, wow, we can get there in two days. Sounds great. Um, the point is, Google found that route very fast. So you know it probably wasn't looking at every little street in Chicago, which it routes you through to try to find the fastest way through Chicago, right? It's probably using heuristics. And it's probably using cleverer search than just Dijkstra to get you there. By the way, the answer to both of those is not probably, it's yes. You notice it also did some clever things, right? It said, well, here's another 42 hour route. Maybe you didn't want the answer, you know, the, the absolute shortest answer to your question. This one's actually a little longer. It's 2873 instead of 2865 miles. And yet uh, it's probably a little, um, you know, that, that's, prob that's not a very big difference. Maybe you wanna go that way instead for some reason. And it's like, uh, you know, you're going from Portland to Philadelphia. Maybe you'd like to fly there. Maybe that would be a thing. And so the system, which you don't normally think of as artificial intelligence, oh, it's just Google Maps. There's no AI there. Well, yeah, it's being pretty smart. It's sort of a baseline level of this is pretty intelligent. And this is the kind of thing that cleverly applied state space search can buy you is the answers to these kinds of questions. So hopefully that gives you a good introduction for what it is we're doing when we think about state space search. And we're gonna have a lot more to say on this topic, a lot more to say about what algorithms to use, a lot more to say about how to model search spaces, but hopefully that gives you some feeling for what it is we'll be talking about as we talk about this topic. That's what I've got for you today. I hope it was helpful. Again, stay safe and well out there. And thank you for listening. I will talk to you again soon.